I was paid a healthy bounty for Ringo and Curly Bill and realized there was real money to be made. That's why I went after Henry Plummer. Now wasn't he the sheriff who augmented his income by shaking down miners and robbing gold shipments? That's the one. Oh yeah, I remember him. He ran that gang of thieving outlaws called the Innocents. So it's true that you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with him? Indeed I did, son. Indeed I did. I knew I needed resources if I was going to track down Roscoe Bob Bryant. And hunting plumber looked like a good way to get rich quick. As the local vigilantes exposed him as the leader of the bandits and put a generous price on his head. Plummer rallied his gang to plunder one last gold mine before making their escape. And that's where I thought I'd find him. father pointed out to me more than once. God made men, but Samuel Colt made them equal. I knew that dynamite wasn't mine, so I decided the polite thing would be to return it. It was the biggest gold rush since Sutter's Mill in 48. Unfortunately, prospectors weren't the only ones drawn to those riches. There were thieves and killers, robbing travelers and hijacking gold shipments. Like those that ran with Plummer, some were just regular folks I knew from town, drawn by greed and easy pickings. Charlie Crow, the blacksmith. James, who worked in the stable. Sam and Jeremiah Barber, the butcher's son. Of course, the rest were veterans of the Civil War. Stone cold killers trained on the bloody fields of Shiloh and Antietam. Plummer had a lot of men on his payroll. A hell of a lot. That son of a bitch pretended to protect the public with one hand while stealing them blind with the other. He set up a defensive perimeter which I had no idea how to breach. Dangerous, desperate individual. I was outnumbered and in way over my head. But I was too damn stubborn and stupid to realize it. I thought I was some kind of hero. I finally made it past and headed on to meet my destiny. But first, I had something I needed to figure out. I had a few ideas on how to get into that mine. But once I made my decision, I knew there was no turning back. So my first thought was to enter the nearest mine portal. I saw an entrance. Made sense. It was the quickest way in, but that also made it more dangerous. As there would undoubtedly be enemy pickets posted along the way. Get out here! You're done. Besides, once you enter a mine like that, it's easy to get all turned around. And that confusing maze of corridors wouldn't even be the worst of it. Some of those shafts could be as deep as hell. A single stumble or misstep can easily end in a deadly plunge to oblivion.
I would just need to be careful not to blow myself to kingdom come. Take that asshole! With all that gunpowder and dynamite everywhere, a body has to know what he's shooting at. One wrong bullet could have turned that mine into a dad blast of two. I freely admit that my plan of attack was not just moronic, but clearly insane. It's a good thing that I abandoned that ridiculous plan before I even tried it. Instead, I spotted a ladder. A way into the mine from the opposite side. It was a long way around, but that approach seemed more sensible at the time. Of course, being I had a problem with heights, that scaffolding scared the bejesus out of me. Climbing down that ladder required some caution. Because even though I had a younger man's reflexes, no man can dodge a damn bullet while climbing down a rickety ladder. I needed to make a leap of faith. I was determined not to give up, however. That Sheriff Plummer seemed quite the despicable character. When the vigilantes discovered what the sheriff was up to, people were outraged. That 10,000 they put on his head would go a long way to help me find old Bob. And I had made it my mission to settle that score come hell or high water. But first, I would have to make a choice. Take the elevator, or climb the ladder. I picked the more convenient and more dangerous route. Show yourself, coward! but that's neither here nor there. The point was, taking him down would save a lot of lives, including my own. Plummer was clearly unhinged, and I could see right away that this was going to take some doing. God damn it! I need some help here! Come on, boy! Take this box on the road! Why 
that's how Henry Plummer died. Him and his crew were worth their weight in gold. And now, I was officially a bounty hunter. So, did you finally go after that Bob feller? Well, I heard word he was in Kansas with John Wesley Hardin. So that's where I went. Where in Kansas? Abilene. Why do you ask, Ben? No reason. Was Hardin as fast as Ringo? Ringo was fast, but John Wesley was as fast as the devil himself. Hell, he killed his first man at 15. From that day forward, he had a price on his head and wouldn't back down for nobody, not even Wild Bill Hickok himself. I dodged death many a time, and that night in Abilene was no good. I was there with the intention of finding that bastard Bob and collecting the bounty on John Wesley. Uh, I thought the Texas Rangers got heart. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they want you to believe. It was cold in a witch's tit in a brass bra that night as I fought my way past his loyal compadres to the very same saloon we're sitting in today. Look around and imagine this place painted in blood. Hardin was waiting for me and... I'm jumping the gun here. Let me back up and give you some background on this some bitch. He deserves that much. Don't you think so, Ben? John Wesley Hardin was a killer. By the end, he confessed to taking the lives of 42 men. Fathers and husbands, brothers and sons, men with families who cared about them. He was a bona fide folk hero by then and had amassed a gang of armed miscreants and other assorted thugs. He and his men set up camp outside of town, and I was hoping Bob was among them. Damn it! Shoot that son of a bitch! Hold still! They didn't ask why I was there. They knew, as most of them were wanted as well. I figured Harden was here somewhere, but to get to him, I'd have to get past his gun hand. I had to spill a lot of blood to find out Hardin wasn't in that camp. He was carousing in town with his closest friends. Hardin's boys apparently didn't want me to reach the bull's head. Some were hightailing it into town to inform their jefe of my unwelcomed presence. was among them. And I steeled myself for the fight ahead. For as good as I was, 
Deep down, I wondered if John Wesley wasn't just a little bit better. Before I could test my mettle against Harden, however, I would first need to dispatch his cadre of hired killers. Most of these degenerates were beyond redemption, but John Wesley might have been a different story. I didn't learn until later that that night was in fact his birthday celebration. mention that I found Martin in this very saloon. <sighs> Suffice it to say, nobody there was happy to see me. felt a certain hostility. I was disappointed that neither Bob nor John Wesley were among the dead. But that was short-lived, as a moment later I was facing down the fastest gun in the West. I felt a bolt of adrenaline, or maybe that was fear. He was well known for his tricks, and I knew I'd need my own if I was ever to defeat him. That man was faster than Grease Lightning, but being inebriated as he was, he didn't count his shots. And now, he was at my mercy. So he didn't die? No, I sent him to prison. Years later, after he was free, some restless Avenger took his life. Shot him in the back in a saloon, just like this one. Anybody up for another beer? Ben? Thank you, darling. Yeah, some say revenge is a dish best served cold. So whatever happened to that Bob guy you were after? Personally, I'd like to hear some of your other adventures. Like, uh, I don't know, do you ever go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a red man?
Yes, I did, Ben. I remember once I was after this renegade Apache, Grey Wolf. Strangely enough, revenge was also his primary motivation. A bounty was put on Grey Wolf's head, and that's how I came to hunt him in the mountains. Mountains so high, they tickled the nether regions of heaven. Grey Wolf was a Chiricahua Apache medicine man who had led a war party in revenge for a massacre against his people. The U.S. Army had attacked his tribe during his daughter's sacred sunrise ceremony. And the slaughter was unspeakable. I understood his anger, as there's nothing more traumatic than seeing those you love die in a cruel and painful death. Right from the beginning, I couldn't shake the feeling that Grey Wolf was watching my every move. He led a band of young Apache warriors who wanted retribution and were more than willing to die for him. They saw me before I saw them. my mind that maybe this wasn't such a good idea, but now that the shooting has started, there was no backing down. It was rugged country, the winter home of the Cherokawas, and that's why they had retreated there. I admit to having some regrets about going after them the way I did, but then again, I've got a lot of those. moment, but I did find the entrance to their hideout. A deep crevice that led to a deeper cave. Don't tell me you're in there. Yeah, but it's not out of bravery so much as pure, angry cussedness. See, back then, I had a stubborn streak a mile wide, and I wasn't about to back down. So it was like pitch black in there? Actually, it was pretty well lit, as they had torches on the walls.
was his cave. Big as hell, Ben. Chiricahua had hid out there during the Indian Wars. They thought it was haunted with the ghosts of those murdered by the horse soldiers. The cave was haunted with dead Indian ghosts? To be honest, I was more concerned with the live ones than the dead ones. you know so much about engines? A few years back, I was married to two Mescalero women. At the same time? Yeah, they were sisters. Polygyny is traditional among the Mescalero. So what happened? Oh, I had to get out of there. Those girls never shut up. Both of them nagging at me all the time. Drove me half crazy. I haven't seen them since. No, I mean, what happened with Grey Wolf? I came upon this flooded grotto, and that's when I saw him. He came to me unarmed and unafraid. His voice echoed in the shadows. And I sensed he meant me no harm. You carry great darkness in your heart. And if you do not release it, it will claim your soul. The sound of his voice put some kind of ancient Indian spell on me. As his story unfolded in my mind. You will come to this place again, and kill many more men, and the darkness will grow until it consumes everything that you are. The soul would have no rain if the eye had no tears. He said I was a great warrior, a coyote man, unequaled by any other pale-faced warrior, or something like that. Snakes will bite shadows of your past until a venom poisons your heart and an echo of the song of the dead summons the spirits deep from within the mountains. I didn't quite get what he was saying, but there was definitely snakes. And indeed, his warriors surrounded me and attacked me like hungry wolverines. They couldn't stop me though, and Grey Wolf wasn't in the mood for idle at all. see any way out of this trap. But suddenly, one just appeared. Kind of like a mirror. I felt like I would be lost in that damn cave forever. Finally, I found myself back outside, perched on the edge of a precipice, overlooking a thundering white water river. To get where I was going required several leaps of faith, but no way in hell I was turning back. I chased after him, determined to make him explain the meaning of all that mumbo jumbo. Mumbo jumbo is right. Are you making this all up as you go? A few details may be fuzzy, brother. But I am relating exactly what happened to me. There were dozens of Apache warriors aiming at me from on high. Dozens? Well, maybe not dozens, but there was a lot of them. At least three or four. Well, more than that, little lady. I had 
a steep climb up creek ahead of me and scrambled up those rocks like a mountain goat. I was determined to locate Grey Wolf and find out exactly what the hell he was trying to tell me. And wouldn't you know it, that crafty son of a bitch led me right into a trap. What kind of trap? Well, son, there had to be at least a hundred Apaches surrounding me. A hundred? God be my witness. Oh, come on. Who are you kidding? Hey, I believe you. Come on, tell us how it ended. All right, but I'm not going to drag this out. Where were we? You were surrounded by a hundred Apache warriors. Well, I didn't take the time to count them exactly, but there were a lot of them. And in the end, a path appeared before me that I had not seen before. I followed it as I desperately needed to find out what Grey Wolf was trying to tell me. But it was like that some of bitch disappeared into thin air. Never did find him. And never did collect my goddamn bounty. Thank you, darling. It's interesting how the truth can sometimes seem, uh, might malleable, depending upon your point of view. Like how those dime novels make you out to be something you're not? Jack, don't be starting trouble. No, he's right. They do tend to exaggerate. Did they exaggerate your part in taking down the Daltons? Well, I was there in the flesh, boy, so I saw what happened firsthand. Those Daltons were lawmen once, before they all went bad, robbing banks and trains clear across the territory. Until Coffeeville, of course. I was one of the citizens who took up arms that day. Fighting on the side of the right? I did my best, sir. We all did. It was early morning. One of my friends was a local gunsmith and he handed out firearms to anybody who'd take one. You see, the Dons got it in their heads to rob two banks at the same time. Two banks on the same damn street. Story was Bob Dalton's girl was always riding him about how he had no ambition. Oh, you're nobody next to Jesse James, she'd say. Finally, the bastard took his brothers to Copperville just to shut her up. Well, the locals recognize the Daltons right off. Before they could get away, half the town took up arms to defend their property. The brothers paid dearly for their stupidity. 
But everybody knows they had it coming. There's more to it than that. I read all about that day, so I know for a fact that it went down very differently. First of all, it was high noon. A posse of U.S. Deputy Marshals were on the rooftop across the street. Get ready, boys. They're gonna make a move. The lawmen had been tracking the Daltons for months, but now they finally had them dead to rights. Among them was a bounty hunt feared by many a lawbreaker. The marshals <laughs> tried to get the Daltons to surrender. They'll give up eventually. We just gotta wait for some bitches. This bounty hunter knew that the brothers were far too proud to ever lay down their guns. He went in there alone to confront those criminals. One of the marshals shouted, Where are you going? Are you crazy? Hey, where do you think you're going, dumbass? That rifle's mine. But he paid him no mind. He saw a way to get around to the back of the bank. Then he figured out how to hit the Daltons from a direction they weren't expecting. From above. Fortunately, a water tower was right there. A moment later, he was climbing up a steep ladder, laughing at danger as he did. It was brave men like him who risked their lives to tame this wild country. <clears throat> Heroic men like him, who did what other men couldn't or wouldn't to make this country free. Jim Is Boone, that Silas Davy Crockett, Son of a bitch. Alamo. Taking down those thieving dolphins. His name was Silas Greaves. And when the dust finally settled, he was the last man standing. Sorry, kid, but that just wasn't the way it happened. It was early evening, not high noon. The Daltons blew up a safe, and were all set to hightail it out of there. Those pathetic deputies surrounding the bank were dropping like flies. Tracking those jokers for months, waiting for them to do something reckless. And finally, they did. Those stupid bastards decided to rob two banks at the same time in the same town where everybody knew them. But they still had friends in Coffee Mill. like a pack of wild dogs, tooth and nail. They were coming at me from all directions. I caught sight of the Daltons running with the money and didn't want to lose them. The problem was,
They knew the town better than I did. And to top it off, I found myself in the middle of another shootout in Tyre. Did the Dolphins pull up in somebody's house? No, it was the uh, Smiths, I believe. They were cousins of the Dolphins. And they were shooting at the Browns, who were shooting at the Dolphins. Which wasn't any surprise, because those two families have been feuding forever. And since the Joneses are related to the Browns, they shot at the Smiths, pissing off the Heimhoffers, whose daughter recently married a Smith. Well, bullets were flying every which way as all the old feuds in Kansas caught fire all at once. There was a hell of a lot of pissed off people in Coffeeville that day. But that's just the way life is sometimes. Shit happens. The Dalton boys knew I would never give up. Those Daltons weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, but they always stood together. They set a trap to slow me down and allow at least two of them to escape. The third brother stayed behind to plan me, just in case that trap of theirs didn't work. It was Emmett, the youngest. And he decided to stand his ground and face me down. I ain't afraid of you, Silas Greaves. This is where it ends for you. He was determined to protect his brothers. I understood how he felt. Taking me on all by his lonesome wasn't exactly a recipe for a long life. Emmett Dalton survived the robbery in Coffeeville. He's the only Dalton who did. They say he was shot 23 times. Well, Dwight, who do you think put all those damn holes in him? But I have to admit, that boy had grit.